Hey, it's Tony Bruski, and this is our Week in Review. Over the weekend, taking a look back at some of the most compelling conversations and stories that we've covered for you of the last week. Brand new episodes back Monday morning, bright and early, 5 a.m. here on the podcast. This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast. With Tony Bruschi. Retired FBI Special Agent Bobby Chacon is with us today. I want to get your take, Bobby, from a a former FBI standpoint on the confusing case of Brian Koberger. It's been confusing from the very beginning. Uh, But another element uh, taking place just uh, the other week, uh, Brian Koberger's parents... Uh, sitting down for an investigative grand jury. Uh, Initial reports were that it was connected to a different homicide, Uh, but then the police in that jurisdiction releasing a statement saying, uh, we have no evidence to link Koberger in any way to this other case. Uh, Confusing to say the least. Uh, Number one, grand juries are completely secret. Uh, So the fact that the police department came out and said anything about the grand jury convening uh, and uh, Koberger having anything to do with that case. A little bit bizarre. Does it have anything to do with that case? Does it even matter if they say it does or it doesn't? Not only that, they, they're not allowed to speak out. I mean, the grand jury, like you said, grand jury is secret. I mean, that's a law. Yeah. Uh, on the federal level, we called it 6E, but it's, it's, um, it's, you're not allowed to talk about grand jury proceedings and stuff. And because for very good reasons, in fact, whenever um, I went into a grand jury and I showed a document or something, that document became secret. And we had a separate safe in our squad area. When I got back to my office, I had to take that out of my file and now lock that and stamp it as 6E material and lock it in a lock safe. In a, in, and no one was allowed to look at that again, except the people that were kind of blessed into that grand jury. And each grand jury is different. Mm-hmm. Every time one expires, a new one gets sworn in. You have to be read into that grand jury investigation. And so, um, you know, there were only a certain amount of people. There was a list on that safe of people that could access it. Um, so it's very secret, um, you know, but in Pennsylvania, if, you know, we all, we know that Koberger was arrested in Pennsylvania. We know that he was taking some steps, right? What we call forensic countermeasures, wearing gloves when he put the trash out, yeah. putting the trash out in front of his neighbor's house instead of his house, you know, things like that, cleaning his car. If the parents now were involved in any of that activity um that's a crime in the state of pennsylvania Mm -hmm. um so you could see the fact that if the parents were or you know if they want to charge even brian himself for some of that activity in pennsylvania um or if they think the parents may have been helping him um then you'd have crimes in the state of pennsylvania which need to be investigated by a grand jury in pennsylvania and by investigators in pennsylvania um uh, and so so grand jury investigations are not any different than than any other investigation. I mean, you could charge somebody with either an information, a complaint, or, or an indictment. Um, an indictment comes from a grand jury, and information or a complaint can be done just by the investigators. Um, they all carry with them different weights. Grand jury indictments are the, the heaviest um, because you've actually presented you know, evidence to a grand jury, which is usually about 23 people, um, citizens who've now said, yeah, there's enough evidence to think that a trial should go forward. Um, the standards are a little different, right? It's 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 a preponderance mm-hmm. of the evidence and not beyond a reasonable doubt um, to get an indictment. But you know, the most most investigations do go to a grand jury um, and and then uh, result in either no true bill, which is no indictment, and or an indictment, which then the person has to go to trial. So here, you know, if they think crimes, the only reason to impanel a grand jury in Pennsylvania is if you think a crime took place in Pennsylvania. Sure, and, and so that's the. That's the obvious thing. Now, who committed the crime, whether they're looking at Brian or his parents or somebody else, who, I, I don't know. It's it's conjecture to say um, the the accused does have a right to appear before a grand jury in most jurisdictions. Um, but you don't get a, a, a lawyer. In, in, there's no judge. There's no lawyers. Um, there's only there's no cross examination. It's only the prosecutor's show inside a grand jury. It's the prosecutor and a witness. Um, and that's it. There's no judge. There's no defense counsel. There's nobody representing that person. You are allowed to step outside and consult a lawyer and then go back in. But that lawyer is not to be allowed to be inside with you. And, and there's no cross examination. Mm-hmm. So um, so grand juries are you know, pretty much one sided for the prosecution. The old saying was, you know, a good prosecutor can indict a ham sandwich. 
um, because it's it's pretty much a one way street, uh, and the prosecutor has all the advantages um, in a grand jury. So, um, you know, but but they often go to a grand jury because it's better to come out with an indictment saying that you know twenty three citizens, not investigators, not law enforcement, not prosecutors, twenty three citizens have decided there's a, there's a preponderance of the evidence that this person has committed a crime and should go to trial on it. Um, so so that's 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 the only thing I could say about that is that the the authorities there must believe that a crime was committed in Pennsylvania and and that you know I don't know who they think did it, mm-hmm. who the subject of that crime is, um, but that's what they're investigating. Well, and, and the big question is, what crime are we talking about here? Because it, it does could this involve the Dana Smithers disappearance? The SARPD coming out tweeting saying no evidence that Dana Smithers' disappearance is in any way tied to Idaho murder suspect Brian Koberger. Uh, does that mean anything, or or could it the grand jury hearing have been in fact about that? Not a tough one. I mean, look, when whenever anybody or an agency makes a pronouncement like that, you you think they've kind of got gone out on a limb. Yeah. Um, because later on, if it turns out not to be true, you've you've lost some public confidence. Yeah. You know, in yourself. So so they must feel. Hopefully, they feel um, that that's the truth. Okay. Uh, whether it is or not, I don't know. But hopefully, they will be able to say, even if it's not, if it turns out not to be true. They could say, well, that's what we believed at the time we made that statement. Yeah. Um, now, why they would make that statement if they're the you know the jurisdiction where the disappearance took place, uh, you would think that they would be the people with the most knowledge of that. And so, if there's a grand jury, you know, happening about that, they would know about that. Now, they wouldn't be able to speak out about what's happening in the grand jury. Sure. Um, but you would hope they wouldn't say the opposite of what they know is true publicly. Yeah. You know, at that point, you just keep quiet about it and I, not make that kind of statement. I mean, we had that at the beginning of the Koberger case saying that we have no leads, no evidence, when in fact they had plenty. Uh, and I get it. Right. You, you don't want to disclose that they were doing their job. They were doing the right thing. But it also shows that they're able to say almost anything they need to to the public to keep them in the path that they want while they do their investigation. Totally understandable to most people. Um, But if we're talking about a crime that was committed here, because even before they connected the Dana Smithers disappearance to this, or there was reporting on it being connected to that, the first thing that came to mind of, well, what crime was committed here, it was concealing of evidence. It was him taking rubber gloves, putting his trash in separate bags, putting it in uh, the neighbor's garbage can, uh, I would think that right there would possibly be the crime that was committed in that jurisdiction at that time. Would that, in fact, be a crime? Yeah, it, it would be. Uh, you know, I, I'm not conversant with Pennsylvania law, but I would think that they have crimes that address, you know, um, activity after the fact. You know, mm-hmm. and and so destruction of evidence is a crime. Uh, knowingly destructive evidence. And and so if he's the subject of the homicide in Idaho, which he is, he would know that he was purposely destroying evidence. So that would be a crime. Um, and then that would be a crime, I would assume, in, in the state of Pennsylvania where it was committed. Um, so so they may be working. I mean, it's quite possible that they're working with the Idaho prosecutors to lodge those types of uh, charges against Brian in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so it you know, looking at the statement, made and 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 what's happened you know we know you know they've already announced uh his activity you know his wearing the gloves all the things you just listed yeah. um and we know that those all you know i would assume are crimes in the state of pennsylvania uh destruction of evidence and, and things like that so um uh, yeah and and if he's charged with that in pennsylvania um then the prosecutors in idaho most likely will ask a judge to be able to put that crime or those activities in front of the jury in Idaho as well. Um, and, and that will um, that will be another piece against Brian Koberg in Idaho. Even, you know, I mean, even if it, it's a it's a minor crime compared to what he did in Idaho. Right. Um, but it might help a jury um, see the entire picture. And it also allowed them to get information from the parents about what was going on in the house when your son got there. Uh, even if they had no idea or no, you know, didn't suspect him of anything, although there's reports to contrary of that. Uh, but if they were just trying to figure out what's going on, they could have said, yeah, he was and backed up. Yeah, he was concealing stuff. He had rubber gloves on this and that to hear from that perspective, which now can be used uh, in the prosecution of him in Idaho. 
That's absolutely right. So when you go into a grand jury, you testify and under oath. And so that becomes a record. And you can't that can then be later used as trial. So at some point, once an indictment is held, uh, handed up, the grand jury doesn't. Become, well, some of it remains secret. But what the, the main gist of it is your your testimony in front of a grand jury um, can then be introduced to trial. Um, oftentimes, to if you say something different at trial than you said in the grand jury, that becomes a problem sure. um, for a trial because your credibility takes a hit. Um, and so I think you're right. I think if they lock the parents in, even if the parents didn't know, mm -hmm. um, some of what they observed, if they didn't know he was the murderer in Idaho, um, couldn't be relevant. And because it, it puts it in a different light, right? Yeah. It, this could be just odd, quirky behavior, um, or it could be something more sinister. And so if you have more knowledge of other things, then maybe the more sinister side of that activity um, it becomes apparent uh, when you don't when you don't have that knowledge, then that activity can just seem quirky or strange or weird. Um, but you don't chalk it up to, oh, this is a murderer getting rid of evidence. I don't know. Yeah. Like you said, some, you know, again, eerily similar to the Gabby Petito case where Brian Laundrie's parents may or may not know have known mm -hmm. he was the actual murderer. Now we're going through that whole process yeah. in that case. Um, in this case, I'm sure there will be an examination of did the dad know uh, what the parents knew when um, did they observe him doing anything, you know, like destroy destroying evidence and knowingly, you know, either helped him or condoned it or didn't take any action uh, in, related to it. So so I think that that's the same. That's a similar, similar pattern, uh, a similar uh, thought process with Brian Laundrie's parents. This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast. The Hidden Killers Podcast. With Tony Bruschi. Always a fascinating conversation with Bobby Chacon. Thank you so much for coming on. Bobby, retired FBI special agent. Hey, if you like this podcast and you'd like to listen to it with no commercials, sign up to be a supporter through Apple Podcast, a premium member. You get access to all of our podcasts all of them, not just this one, but all of them in the True Crime Today family, and you get access to them all commercial free. Worth checking out. If you binge a lot, you'll like that feature. Trust me. My name is Tony Bruschi. Stay with us.